and to all of you, the Oaks of Arcadia, are you thankful yet? <laughs> Amen. I am. I am thankful to God for this opportunity to praise him in his word today. That said, with all that there is to be thankful for, I must tell you this morning, I am sad to say, that today we come to the end of something else that I've been thankful for, and that is our journey through the life of David. Uh, the reason for the end of this is simple. Christmas is coming, and we've got to begin celebrating or preparing to celebrate the coming of Jesus to begin as David did, turning toward the celebration of the birth of our Lord. Anybody in here excited for Christmas? Any Christmas fans in here? All right. Well, we haven't even done Thanksgiving yet, so. But that's awesome. Now, that means this morning we need to find out what becomes of the life of King David and just what is so important about 2 Samuel chapter 7. So let's read together 2 Samuel 7, beginning in verse 1, in the inspired, inerrant, and matchless word of our Lord. The scripture tells us, Now when the king, that is David, lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I've been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you, that the Lord, David, will make you a house. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever, and this is the word of the Lord. Amen. You can have a seat. So by now, we have come to know that David, through all his ups and downs and all his wrongs and rights, David is a man who loves God. As we said, the prevailing wind of David's life, it blows in a Godward direction. David's heart's desire is to be in alignment with God. David is a man after God's own heart. And from beginning to end, all throughout the life of David, we have seen the uniform, clear message has been about alignment with God. From beginning to end, God continues to say, I need you to stay in alignment with me. And what we see here in the text this morning, we see that after many years of fighting, in his journey from the shepherd's field to the establishment of the holy city of Jerusalem, when things had finally calmed down, David had settled into a time of peace, living in his palace in Jerusalem. David had it in his heart to do a tremendous work for the Lord. David had it in his heart to do a monumental great thing for God. And despite David's desire and the thing he wanted to do being good, God said no. When we started this journey through the life of David, we began with the message, don't grieve when God says go. Do you remember that? God's prophet Samuel, he was still hung up on King Saul. He was stuck grieving the dismissal of Saul, not knowing the good things that were coming. And God said, I need you to move on. I need you to move on from your grief. Stop grieving the place where I no longer am. I need you to move on from where I have moved on. And we said, don't grieve when God says go. Well, here today, we see David has it in his heart to do something amazing for the Lord, something good, the scripture says, but despite it being David's heart's desire, it being for God and it being good, 
the Lord had a different plan. And we learn our final lesson from the life of David today. We learn to have gratitude when God says no. And this chapter, it holds tremendous significance in the overarching story of God's plan and its relationship to the unfolding story of, of all the scripture as the scripture all points to Christ. And we're going to see that. But it's interesting that we receive this chapter and the good news that God reveals to his people here in the midst of God's king desiring to do something incredibly important and special, specifically for God, and God says no. You ever experienced that? Where you had your heart set on something that you were certain was a good thing, a godly thing, a God-honoring thing. Maybe even had the encouragement of other godly people, and at the end of it all, it just it didn't happen. It just wasn't meant to be. Now, maybe you invested yourself deeply in something. Maybe you've left something else entirely behind. You've trained, you've pursued, you've longed, you've prayed. You've asked God to make a way, but the answer, it just seems to be no. Maybe today you can look back at things you'd hoped for, you'd hoped to do, aspirations from a past season of life, and you ask, why? Why did God not bless these good desires that were in my heart, these things that I wanted to do for him? But what do you do when you have something good in your heart to do and God says no? And we pick up this morning in David's life here in verse 1 where we read that this came about when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. Now we know, having followed David from the time that he was just a boy, that David came from next to nothing. His arrival at this moment, it hadn't come easy. David spent years running from Saul, sleeping in caves, engaged in battle with the enemies of Israel, enduring hardship, fighting. And so by the time we arrive here, with David in the palace, in a time of rest, and in a time of peace, to hear this statement that David has arrived this is a statement of the Lord's blessing. As he sits in his house and he considers the goodness of God, God's promises to him and all that God has brought him through, and now here he is, giving God the glory, he has to be just incredibly moved by the overwhelming blessing of God. The humble shepherd boy, now the people of God's great king, sitting in this amazing palace, a palace that was a gift, a, a massive political gift, entirely free, built entirely by builders and resources sent by the neighboring king of Tyre. And he's overwhelmed by the goodness of God. And he goes to the prophet Nathan, and he says, how can I live in such a beautiful palace while the ark of God sits in nothing more than a tent? That makes sense. But David had it in his heart to build a great house for the Lord, to do all that he possibly could for God. But David had the right heart. He had the right perspective to see that he had been abundantly blessed. And I want to ask you, as we approach Thanksgiving, and we gather all the family, we shovel in the turkey, we put on the football, and we drift off into our trip to Fancoma, have you stopped to remember the entire reason for the existence of this holiday to stop and recalibrate your heart. To have the right heart, the right perspective to see that you, we, are abundantly blessed. To give God the praise, to honor God with thanksgiving. After all that God's done for him, with all that he has for himself, David, he cannot see not giving his absolute best for God. He has the ability to do this. He knows this is a right desire. He wants to do something great for the work and glory of God. And his kind of thinking, comparing all that he has with the work of God that remains to be done in the world, it's good. And we actually see this same desire of the Old Testament people of God again, hundreds of years later. When the Israelites, after they'd been displanted in the exile to Babylon, 
They're returned to Jerusalem. They find God's temple in ruins. And the prophet Haggai, like David, he asks, is it not wrong that you yourselves dwell in your paneled houses while the house of the Lord lies in ruins? Is it not wrong that when we look around and have the right gratitude to recognize that we are abundantly blessed by God? Simple question is, as you give thanks, is it not wrong that we are then content to not give back our best to God? To not do all that we can to advance the work of God's kingdom in the world. As you give thanks this Thanksgiving, can your conscience live with the total sum of what you give to God in light of what God has already given to you? In light of all that you have and do for yourself. David saw all that he had, and he said, I can't be content to receive all this and not do all I can to invest myself in what is important to God. And so David does the biblical thing. From here, he goes to seek godly counsel. He goes to the man that he knows God has given to him as a spiritual counselor, a man that he knows hears from God. And what better counselor could he seek out than God's prophet, Nathan? And so I ask, do you have a Nathan in your life. My suggestion to you, I would suggest that every one of us should have a few Nathans in our life. Do you have any godly counsel? Do you have anyone to help you determine what the will of God is for you? And do you have ears to hear and the heart to listen even when God says no? Or would you prefer not to have otherwise godly people's input? and merely continue on in pursuit of your own desires as if God is simply endorsing whatever idea you have and whatever is in your own heart to do. David sought Nathan, and he says, Nathan, this isn't right. It's not right that the king should have this palace and the ark of the covenant of the Lord should be sitting in a temporary tent. I want to build the Lord a house. A permanent dwelling place for the Ark of the Covenant, a place the Lord can fill with his presence and all the nations can see and know where all the people can come and gather and draw near and give their worship to God. And Nathan, David's godly counsel, he says, yeah! He says, thumbs up! Go do it! Go and do all that's in your heart, for the Lord is with you. It sounded right to the king. It sounded right to the prophet. I'm sure that they left that conversation completely stoked. Let's go. Now that night, after Nathan had told David yes, God spoke to Nathan and he said, verse 5, go back. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? God says, you're going to build a house for me? No, David. The Lord declares through the prophet in verse 11, the Lord will make you a house. God will make a house for you. David has it in his heart to build it, and God says it's not for you to do. He says, it's not my plan. But God had a different plan for David. It wasn't the plan David had. It wasn't the plan that he thought he wanted, but it was the plan that God had for him. And God reveals to David his place in his plan and reveals to David a promise far, far greater, far beyond the building of a physical temple. God said, you're not going to build a house for me, David, but I declare to you, I am making you a house. God said, no, David, I will build a house for you. And of course, God wasn't referring to a house of stone and cedar like David was, but God, we are told, had in mind to build a dynastic house for David, a dynasty through David, a line of royal descendants, a lineage of kings that would come from the family line of David. So look back at the text with me. Verse 12, Nathan continues, speaking the word of the Lord to David. God says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And when he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, 
as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke the word of the Lord to David. Now, what we have here is a covenant. A promise that God makes to David in one of the most well-known covenants and passages of Bible prophecy. And as with so much of Bible prophecy, there are dual fulfillments that happen within this prophecy. And by that I mean that some of what is said, it is far off. And some will be fulfilled in David's lifetime, in David's literal son. For instance, God says, verse 12, When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, that is, when you die, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. And verse 13, he shall build a house for my name. And we know that's what happened. David had a son, King Solomon, who became king after David died, and Solomon did build the temple. However, other parts of this prophecy couldn't possibly be fulfilled in Solomon because look at verse 12 again. Again, God says, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. But he doesn't stop there, right? He keeps going. He says, and, and, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And drop down to verse 16, your house and your kingdom shall be made forever, shall be sure forever before me. Forever? Now, surely forever is not going to be fulfilled in Solomon. And that brings us to the bigger point of this passage, because we've already established that it wasn't for David to build a temple, to be a temple builder. That God had a work for David, a promise for David, but the temple, it wasn't his to do. And David, he heard the word of the Lord, he had the heart to submit, to accept God's will, and he continued praising God even when God said no. David had it in his heart to do something amazing, something good for God, the culmination and crowning act and achievement of his life's work for the Lord, and God said no. And now we've seen that the point, it's, it isn't that God didn't want a temple, he did. And David's son Solomon in the very next generation would build the temple. And though it would be torn down by the Babylonians and then rebuilt again, God's temple in Jerusalem, it became the meeting place of God with men, the central location of Old Testament worship, and the focal point of Israelite identity for a thousand years until the coming of Christ. David had desired a good thing. And God desired there be a temple. It's simply that David wouldn't be the one to build it. It wasn't David's lot. His lot instead was to clear the way by living into God's calling on his life, which was to be a man of war, to clear the enemies of Israel. And the building of the temple, it was going to be for someone else. And if we're real, we can imagine that that could have been incredibly disappointing. Further than that, David had to have asked, as one pastor said, all right, Lord, you've mapped out a path for me. It's not what I wanted. I'm ready to accept it, and I'll do the hard thing that you're calling me to do. But here's what I want to know. What's going to happen when I'm gone? What will come of all my effort and all my work? What will last? Will anything that I do have any lasting value? And you remember, there'd only been one king before David, and everything Saul had lived for, it, it died with him. Saul's house was never established long term. There was just Saul, and then there was the end of the line of Saul. Saul's house was wiped out, and David wants to know, am I going to be another Saul, or will all that I have worked for continue beyond my lifetime? And that surely is a great question for all of us. What will come of your life? What will remain after you are gone? Will it be that everything you've lived and worked for just sort of just dies with you? After all the effort that we extend, will anything that we do be of lasting value, or will our life's work be like sandcastles that are just washed away as soon as the tide comes in? Well, God has the most marvelous answer to this most fundamental question. He says, verse 12, David, 
When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. Do you see what God's saying to David? David, you need to know this when you're pressing on in the hard work I'm calling you to do. Your work for me, it will not be in vain. And I want to say to every Christian here today that when you serve the Lord, your labor in the Lord, it will not be in vain. The Apostle Paul says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If all that you work for and all that you do ends when you die, you would be in the most miserable position. But God says to David, that's not how it will be for you. And God says to us in Jesus Christ, that is not how it will be for you and me. What you do will have lasting value. This is an amazing covenant. Because in these verses, God has made clear to David, there is a promise that I'm making to you, and it's a promise that is ours in Jesus Christ. God says, the commitment that I'm making to you, death cannot break it and sin cannot break cancel it it's wonderful all because of this one little word here forever Uh, this is why we know that this promise isn't just david's but this promise is ours in jesus christ this is not merely about what god has to say to david but the reason that we care the reason we're reading it today the reason we can celebrate this and give thanks for this is because of what it means for us in jesus God says, I will bring forth from you a son. And, verse 13, God says, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Clearly, we know Solomon didn't live forever. So it couldn't have meant that this was for Solomon, and this was fulfilled in Solomon. And again, here it comes again in verse 16. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever. Your throne shall be established forever. So what does this prophetic covenant promise mean? As one pastor explains, it could mean one of two things. Number one, it could mean that at any given time in history, there would always be a descendant of David sitting on the throne. And that cannot be the meaning for this simple reason, that it did not happen. The last descendant of David to reign in Jerusalem was Zedekiah, And that reign ended in the year 586 before the birth of Christ. The line of David's descendants, of course, continued. But no one from that line sat on the throne in Jerusalem from that day, 586 B.C. to today. So this promise cannot mean that at every point in history, forever, there would always be a descendant of David on the physical throne. That hasn't been true since the year 586 before the birth of our Lord. So... We go to the second meaning that these words could bear, and it is this. The promise could mean that there will be one person in the line of David whose reign will be forever. And that's why when the New Testament opens up, and when we're taking these texts up at Christmas, we see in the Gospel of Matthew that it opens by introducing us to Jesus as being born in the lineage of Of David. The first line of the uh, Gospel of Matthew, it reads, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And in Luke, the angel comes to Mary and announces to pregnant virgin Mary, behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great and will be called the son of the most high, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. And so the scripture makes it very clear. The promise that God is giving here to David, it does not mean that there will always be a Davidic king. Because after all, hope for God's people, it doesn't lie in the continuance of a dynasty. Hope for God's people lies in a person. One person who will be born into the line of David and will fulfill this amazing promise that is given in his reign will be forever. And now we see God reveals to David that he is building something so much bigger than a building. And God makes this incredible promise to David, an eternal glorious promise. And in Christ, God is making an incredible, eternal, glorious promise to you. 
In Christ, we are a part of this promise, the promise of being sons and daughters, heirs, and the lineage of the eternal king. And so like David, this is where I have to return when I have good desires and God says no. Because you know how much it hurts to simply want to teach a Bible study and be told no. To just want to come up and sing a special to want to give your input and have it rejected, to want to do something charitable, honorable, to try to give yourself to a particular area of service, to train for a particular career, to give your life to a task and never have it turn out the way that you had hoped, to have it in your heart to find a spouse and to make a godly home, to have a child, to dedicate them and raise them for the Lord. And it doesn't come to pass. David had a deep, deep godly desire. He wanted to build God's temple. And he had the resources and he had the ability to do it and God said no. It had to have been a massive disappointment. But David, he received instead this promise. And so how did David respond? What did David do? Let's, let's bring this back down to earth, back down on the ground. What does this mean for me and you? How did David respond? What did David do? The first Chronicles 22 tells us what he did. David didn't stop praising God. David didn't shut down. David didn't stop working on God's behalf. No, David, he spent the rest of his life preparing the resources and the work for Israel and for his son to continue. It says David set stone cutters to prepare dressed stones for building the house of God. David also provided great quantities of iron for nails for the doors of the gates and for clamps as well as Bronze in quantities beyond weighing, and cedar with timbers without number. For the Sidonians and the Tyrians brought great quantities of cedar to David. For David said, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced, and the house that is to be built for the Lord, it must be exceedingly magnificent of fame and glory throughout all the land. And I will therefore make preparation for it. So David provided materials in great quantity before he died. And he called for Solomon, his son, and he charged him to build a house to carry on the work of the Lord. David gathered the resources and he made whatever preparations he could make for God's work to go forward. David got up, he got to work, and he lived the rest of his life like he believed the promises of God were true. David committed himself to the selfless, relational, generational kingdom work of God. He made all the preparations that he could for others, for the next generation, to be able to experience the glory of having a house of worship for the Lord and to carry forth God's covenant, that God would be praised and that covenant would ultimately be answered in Christ. But for David, his life, his efforts, no matter how amazing they may have been, at the end of his life, all his contributions in faithfulness to God, they reach so far beyond himself. So far beyond his own life and so far beyond a building. But God told him to live into his covenant plan and David laid down his plans and moved forward in faithfulness to God to prepare the people for the coming of God's Christ. And brothers and sisters, it is time to start living as if we believe, as if we believe that God has a plan that culminates in the coming again of Jesus Christ. As if we believe that Jesus is actually coming again. Jesus is coming again. Do you believe that? It is time to live as if we actually believe that. To let go of our unfulfilled, unanswered earthly dreams and desires and disappointments for whatever it is that we are building and to do like David did, a man in alignment with God, a man after God's own heart, to not grieve when God says go, to have gratitude when God says no, to want nothing more than to know the Lord's presence, to choose in everything alignment over appearance, to reach far and wide to the right and to the left, to gather the resources and provide the support so that the brothers and sisters can take the love of God and go. And to know that our greatest calling, our greatest blessing is to be invited, included in the generational, eternal, glorious lineage of saints, blessed to be loved by the Father, called sons and daughters of God, and so we are. And for that, we have so much 
for which to be thankful. For gratitude, even when God says no. And like David, we can recognize and we can find fulfillment and joy in knowing that God is calling us to something greater, building beyond whatever it is that we are building. And we can know our labor in the Lord. It is not in vain. And when we don't get to do what we thought we would or what we most wanted to do or what we're doing, it doesn't look like what we dreamed it would be. But we can rest in this promise. And we can think of David. And we can know that David, as he stands in the presence of God right now, David, right now, up to David, it no longer matters one iota what he did and didn't get to do while he was here on this earth. Because David was faithful to God, and the book of Revelation tells us that now, before the throne of God, he serves him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne shelters him with his presence. And he hungers no more, and he thirsts no more. He wants for nothing. He longs for nothing. Because the lamb in the midst of the throne is his shepherd, who guides him to springs of living water, and he wipes away every tear from every eye. So when you finish this life, and you are faithful in Christ, and you stand in the presence of God, you will not weep for what you did not have on earth, for what you did not do but only celebrate in gratitude God's goodness and his eternal love for you forever. Now this morning, I want to invite you to be there, to call you to press forward, to call you to lean in and to join God in what he is building for us in Christ, an eternal kingdom with a heavenly home and glory and joy forever with him. And that's something for which we can be thankful. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I pray, Father, for your healing and your peace and contentment for all of us in those broken, empty places in our hearts, Lord, where every one of us has heard you say no. Father, for our lives, which oftentimes don't really look exactly the way that we imagined that they would and for our frustration oftentimes as things don't always go the way that we pray that they would go father even when we desire to do good for you father i am thankful that you know what is good that you have good plans for us and father you tell us that you are working all things for the good of those who love you father would you help us to trust you and rest in your promise, but to have gratitude that you have a good eternal plan and that you love us. It's by the aid of your spirit and in the matchless authority of your son, Jesus Christ, to you, Father, we pray. Amen.